healer to me. He's ever a healer to me. Covers me with his righteousness. He's ever a healer to me. He's ever a healer to me. A healer, healer he is to me. When I'm fallen, when I'm wounded and worn. Arms again. What a healer, healer he is to me. How often have I wandered away? Drifted away, but Jesus had Himself just to rescue me. He treats me as no rebel. At all, a healer, healer he is to me. When I'm fallen, when I'm wounded and worn. What a healer, what a healer, what a healer, healer he is to Good evening once again, brothers and sisters, from wherever you have been watching. How I long to touch your hands and see your smiles. <laughs> I believe the Lord has been good to all of us. And um, at this stage, I want us to continue. It's our third presentation. We are continuing on the same theme, preparing to meet the bridegroom. I've already said we don't say prepare to meet the bridegroom, preparing. In other words, we are, we are engaged with the work of preparing to meet the bridegroom. And we must understand what that means to us. So that 1 Corinthians, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8, you must read it very carefully. So that we who are appointed to proclaim this truth should not stumble on them like old Israel did uh, in preparing for the coming of Christ. Now, I will read for our start Song chapter 5, verse 1, Song of Solomon, chapter. 5 verse 1 
I'm just paraphrasing the portion that says that um, I have gathered the spices from my garden. And then I want to leave it there. I'm not going to read it for you. I'm referring you to it. <laughs> First, I mean, uh, Song chapter 5, Song of Solomon chapter 5, verse 1. Well, I just want us to underline, he shall gather from his garden uh, the spices. Uh, then, what is the significance of that? The garden... <laughs> uh, when we look at, at that with the garden uh, gun, uh, in Hebrew, then it will mean a fenced city or a fenced uh, place. Um, and, and First Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, will speak of a church as a fenced uh, area uh, where uh, it's a pillar in the ground, in other words, uh, that is protected, the armament of God resides. Now, um, figuratively, I'm interested in Myra as one of the spices. And um, I want us to look at it to say, what is the meaning of that? Then um, there are about uh, three ways um, that relate to Myra as a spice. Uh, the other word will then uh, refer to uh, Kelly, a jewel, but again, figuratively, Kilia in Hebrew, a mind. So then, when we speak of Myra, we must know that it it includes the process of jewel making or it includes uh, the process of learning and perfecting knowledge or being sanctified like John 17 17 you shall be sanctified by the sanctify them with your weight for your weight is the truth okay so then uh, Myra will then mean the process of distilling in other words, when you distill, it's like when you take a certain element from a particular product, then you, you, it's like you squeeze it out and then until that element comes out. So in other words, uh, it is knowing the truth in verity. Uh, the truth in verity is called aletheia. In other words, that which remains when all other things fall apart. So then, uh, he says they are gathered from his garden, the spices. Now, the spices will be the myra, and then will, it will be an example of what? The jewels, he will gather his jewels from the garden. It will also uh, mean the mind. He will gather those whose mind are refined by scriptures. <laughs> From what? From the garden. He starts first in the fenced city, in the fenced, um, what you call garden, or the fenced place. Uh, then when you read First Peter chapter 4, verse 17, says, For the time is come that judgment must begin in the house of God, and it is first begin, and it, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of Christ? In other words, judgment begins with that. Now, <laughs> what does that, how will that mean? If we are, uh, if we who believe in the gospel and we don't stumble, are decorating the breastplate of Christ, he enters with us ceremonially into the most holy place to make reconciliation for us with him. In other words, when is the priest making reconciliation for him and his house? Before he can make reconciliation for the other people. <laughs> you, you must read that. Eh? In other words, the righteous judge, the righteous 
people are judged before the judgment of the wicked people. So, right now, we have judgment in two phases. And all of that begins with those picked up as jewels in his garden. Uh, the fifth angel uh, blows the, the trumpet and then I heard uh, voices under the altar. And, and uh, you see, uh, they were given white robes and they were told to sleep a little. So that then is the judgment of the righteous dead who had anticipated by scripture that 1844 will be the time of the coming of Christ, whilst it was the taking up of the kingdom of Christ. Uh, I could be, uh, okay, let me leave it. So then, when we look at that then, if from his gardens, from his garden, in other words, judgment begins in the house of God, with the righteous first. And after that, it will go to the wicked dead. And after the wicked dead, the wicked living. And after that, the word will come. It is done. So then, it is very clear that it is very important to check our contribution in the house of God. If we are bitter, if we are wicked, in the house of God. We are manifesting the character that needs to be manifested in the church because I will put enmity between you, the woman, and the seed of the serpent. The seed of the serpent shall persecute the seed of the woman and that must happen to the end of time. So whatsoever is not true, whatsoever is not of good report, whatsoever is evil, that thing is sin. And it must be like that, that there must be a division caused by the midnight cry. What is the midnight cry? That testimony that will be given to separate God's people or to drive away the night that was covering and causing everyone to stumble and to fall. So come on, come on. God's people are light bearers. So what is a light bearer? It's an imbiber of light. In other words, the candle is not lit so that it can give itself light. It is lit for the sake of others. And therefore, when we look at that then, we see that there are spices of myra, there are jewels, there are people whose minds are reformed and transformed by the truth. Those are the ones who will be picked up first, gathered up first. The righteous in the garden of God, in the church of God. Now, you see, sometimes every time when we bury people as pastors, as elders, and so on, we, we seem to forget about the their real selves and what they stood for. But I think it is good that every one of us must write his obituary or her obituary when he lives, especially that it be ple a pleasing sacrifice before the Lord. And that obituary can only be written to be good and pleasing to the Lord if we give a reasonable service to God. So when we look at that, then we see that in the house of God, like in the garden, for the truth. Now, when we say truth, we don't mean for an opinion. Truth is not an opinion. Truth, truth is a fact that has eternal consequences without changing. In other words, truth is infinite. Even when you go a million years to come, it doesn't change. It's not affected by time like an opinion. Uh, so here then we see those who use the words of scriptures as jewels coming up as an armor through their mouth or their lips and who love the Lord and speak in his defense. Those people are what? Are like a spice called Myra. 
Myra is from Mara bitterness. You know, there are people who, whose characters we don't like, even if we believe with what they are saying, but we don't like how they say it. I think when we put on the, the, the wedding garment, it's when we learn to discipline self so that we don't follow what is pleasing to our tastes or senses, but we follow what is true and correct and just. And that which is a clear duty of all men. So then when we look at that, then we see that the, 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 the Myra there, those who are picked up as a bundle of Myra, they, it's simply a, a figure to say God will gather together all those, whether in the same period of time or different periods of time, he will be, as he said, to those souls that slept under the altar in, I think it's chapter 6, verse 9, uh, Revelation, where he says, uh, he said to them, sleep a while until the number of your brethren that shall be killed like you. In other words, something that happened in the past will happen again, requiring people to stand up and to stand out without caring for human relationships, but caring for the salvation of their souls and what is the right duty of men to be done. You know, sometimes when you stand, you say, hey, with whom shall I stand? You stand with the truth. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So you are, not, you are never alone if you are with the truth. In fact, the, when you study Revelation 3 from verse 14, this is the testimony of the true witness and who says, I'm Alpha and Omega. The true witness, there are no witnesses when it comes to God. There are no witnesses. There are no majorities. There's a witness. Eh? So then, in other words, if you testify, you testify to say what the one who testified before has said. You, you testify to its correctness. In other words, uh, there are no two witnesses. But even if they can be 100, they confirm the story of one. They each speak as one to confirm the story of one. It's one times one, not one plus one. So there is no pain, there is no anxiety, there is no uh, uh, trial that we will go through that our Savior has not walked along it first. We know he was despised and rejected by men. But today, people want to be loved and rejected by God. I think that is a bad, a bad thing, a bad choice to make. What we need to do is to seek for that which is true and to accept it, even if it comes with bitterness. Because by doing that, we will then be showing that we know the value of the truth. In other words, when you criticize something, you don't criticize it because you hate it, but you criticize it because something is wrong. In other words, you walk not by sight, but you walk by faith. And, and many people misunderstand that saying, to be saying to walk by sight means what you see is what you say it is. The Bible says no, the righteous doesn't walk by sight, but he walks by faith. And what is the difference? Sight concludes what appears to be true. Whereas faith wants the evidence of the substance that needs to be there. <laughs> so then faith is rational. Faith is logical acceptance. You don't say yes before you, you are clear on the matters. You don't say no before you are clear on the matters. That's the character of the child of God. And sometimes when you question, you cause discontentment, you cause bitterness, but so it was with the Lord. He was offending many on answering in correction to relate to people what are the true order of things. 
not what you see, but what has to be, what ought to be. So then that is why then your teaching may cause you to be like Myra, bitter, but sweet in its consequences. And therefore, when you go to Matthew, Malachi 3, verse 15 to 18, we read that Malachi 3, verse 15 to 17, that's in the New King James Version, and now we call the proud happy. Yeah, they that work wickedness are set up. In other words, they succeed. Don't, don't, that is why the Bible said, don't follow the majority in doing wrong. What does that mean? Don't pervert the truth for the sake of suiting. Eh? To be suitable, suiting the, the, the majority or those that you think deserve to be respected. You don't do that. You're, what is happened? It's a, the wicked prosper because other people set them up. You know, when you are wrong, especially in the church of God, no one must respect your position. It's wrong. By respecting your position, you qualify the character. In other words, if the devil is on the seat, you'll say, I'll be killing you where you're not sitting on God's uh, seat. <laughs> what needs to happen is that we need to love the truth and everything it's supposed to be what it was meant to be by God, by the testimony of the word of truth. Then when you look at that, say, don't let the wicked succeed, especially in the house of God. Uh, yeah, they, they that tempt God are even delivered. In other words, they've got big support. Sometimes my other friend said to me, if you are a good person, why are there chaos uh, during your leadership? And I said, ah, if Christ had done a good work, why was he crucified? So some, sometimes we, we mistake the fear of God with the standard of or the sayings of men. But the ways of the Lord are not the ways of men. Sometimes you do a good job, people reject you, it is time for you to be naked. And that was the problem of Paul. Paul said, if God wants me to do the good work, why is he giving me the thorn in the flesh? Because I could be excelling were it not of the thorn. Yes, that is to remind you that you are nothing. You are dust called to serve the Lord. So whether you say this is the lowest position, you are dust, that's where you belong. That is, whatever it is, so then the grace of God is sufficient for you. So then when we look at this, then we realize then the Bible says then the wicked, we must not prosper the wicked. Once we prosper the wicked, what do we do? We are at the same time killing and denying the Lord. You know, uh, many people when we started in the struggle said, are you going to receive tithe? <laughs> and I say, what is tithe? And, and I say, tithe, tindes. Tithe is a symbol, a token of the strength of the Lord. And what does God want it for? He says that there may be food in my house. And what is food in my house? It's not a salary for the workers. Food in my house, food from the word lacham in Hebrew, means a, a, an, in, an armor, you know, like bread a, of Gideon, that the Midianites dreamt of bread, slaying the camp, and they say the bread is Gideon, Laham, bread. The bread in the house, the armament in the house, to do what? To fight evil. So we don't, in other words, when there is, where there is evil that needs to be resisted, you can't take the Lord's tithe, an instrument of fighting wickedness, you can't take it and support it to the wicked one who's on the seat where God has been dethroned. You have to use it to dethrone him. So that's it. And, and by the way, uh, I've been reading <laughs> uh, on the, the church manual, Seventh Adventist church manual, and I like the stewardship 
uh, part of it that says the aim of every church is to train every member to be a treasurer. And then if, if you do that, then where is the storehouse? No, well, we are not dealing with it. The storehouse is in your house. You take out the tenth, but you remain with the, with the ninth. So where is much? Much is not where your ten has gone. It's where your nine is remaining. It is still in God's hand in your house. You are the treasurer. If you are faithful there, then you, you have done your part. Where the other ten uh, adds up, then the treasurer there will be responsible. When you have done your part as a treasurer, he must do his part as a treasurer. And you look at it all, then you end up understanding, if you know the system of Adventist Church, that the storehouse is everywhere where there is a treasurer. All right. Uh, then when we pass there, then we understand that Micah Malachi is saying to us, then they that fear the Lord speak one to another, and the Lord heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought uh, on, on his name. So when we look at that, then you can see, prepare to meet the bridegroom for this time when he gathers the jewels. What does that mean? It means living in a way that a book of remembrance, your name is written in the book of remembrance. But what quality needs to be done? Here, the names of those who feared the Lord and thought of its name. Now, what is to think of his name? To think of his name is not to take his name in vain. So, Jesus, Jesus. But <laughs> to think of his name, when we look at it, is a cow sharp in, in, in Hebrew. And it means to have mental efforts of creating what? Mental effort to think of creating a product of value. So in other words, when you are a member or a, a member of God's church, you are born again, you love the Lord, then it must worry you how to increase the value of God's church on earth whether with your time, with your talent, with your whatever. Never be a spectator, but be like that little boy who says, we have received so much good. How can I increase value? And when the means were called, he did not say me first. He says, first the master who has done so much for me. And we know the end of that consequence. And they shall be mine, said the Lord of hosts, in the day that I make up my jewels. And then I say, Myra, jewels, and a polished mind. These are all jewels. These are all perfumes. These are all pleasing to the Lord. And these are needed in the final days of the great controversy. People of clear minds, people who are students of the word, people who want to dream high in terms of making the work of God to succeed. People who mourn over the evil that is done in the church. People who don't reward wickedness. People who fear the Lord and counsel together. How do we make the work of the Lord succeed? So when we read it says, the Lord will spare them as his son uh, that has saved him. So, you see, the, the, the road to glory is not paved by the pavement of gold. And we don't choose the trials and the challenges that we go through. But we know, like Psalms chapter 19, when it speaks of the heavens, speak of the glory of the Lord. They, 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 night, they give their speech and they're never quite... La, la, la. So that simply means God has ordained that in every moment of midnight in his church, 
there will be those who will have courage and the faith to stand and shine to drive back, shine the light to drive back the night. Not that they may be glorified, but that righteousness may prevail. So th this is something that is very serious and it's a privilege for all of us to understand. So Song of Solomon puts the time of the making of the jewel as a time of betrothal. In other words, before the marriage feast, there must be the time of humiliation, giving testimony in sackcloth. We know we've got nice clothes, nice suits, but now we put on sackcloth and say things that are displeasing and pleasant, but that are true. So that, you know, like it is that the worldly lovers and the sinners must not be comfortable in the house of God because now the sword of the spirit is being used skillfully and diligently. So just for record, the betrothal is a process of marriage that happens at the bride's house to consummate marriage. It is done in the middle of the night and only between the bride and the groom. In the morning, they come out of the chamber for marriage feast or wedding. So then we can say this is the time of awakening. So when we prepare to meet the bridegroom, among others, we must awaken. And when we are awake, we are mentally able to coordinate what we see with what we think and with what we're supposed to do. You can't see the light and not think of what next. You can't see the light and be impartial unless you are disabled. So this is the time to arise, the time to awaken, for winter is past and the rain is over and gone. What does it mean? Then the time of writing our names in the book of memory of the Lord is the time where through the searching of the scriptures, we reconcile with what the prophecies says it shall be or say it shall be with the children of God in times such as this. In other words, uh, Peter says, we know from scripture what are the meaning or meanings of our time according to the day light of scripture. And what do they signify? In other words, what am I called to do? What are we called to do? We are called to mourn and sigh over the wickedness that wants to dominate the house of God. We are to mourn and sigh over the wicked spirits that want to destroy and dehumanize all things which are the image of God on earth. We are to mourn and sigh to understand what is our duty prescribed by the prophecies for this time. Mourn and sigh to receive the right spirit that will make us to live uh, in the face of God under circumstances that we are in. For now, the rain is over and gone, which is the gentle showers, the former rain and the latter rain, the gentle showers before the uh, main rains that the thunderous will come and that will come before the uh, harvest is reaping. Geshem. So the Geshem will refer to both the former rain and the, the latter rain. Uh, so then Ire, I come into my garden and I gather my mind. In other words, may now what I'm praying for is that may the Lord give us the fruits, fruits of his spirit, that we be gentle, we be meek, we be truthful, we be lovely, that we are able to emulate and rejoice when we are persecuted and we suffer for righteousness, that we don't offer our bodies as a sacrifice while our hearts are defiled. May we be purified with the spirit of love, dedication, and commitment necessary for this time to shout like the trumpets
to give the warning that needs to be done to the world and to us as a people, to bring us that strength and unity that reflects the will of God for his people in this time that we are living in, for the salvation of many and for our encouragement. In Jesus' name and for his sake we pray, amen.